Good morning, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and work on 110 today. And so I just wanted to um, remind you guys that I put in an announcement about the AP exam for you guys on Canvas. And so it marks some of the changes. Also, you probably got an email that they are going to have some review sessions online for you guys via YouTube. And so please note that that is Eastern time. So you want to make sure you do your calculations to ensure that you're going at the right time. Um, I just want to make sure that you guys are uh, understand or you might notice that the first ones that they post for our history are based on the Pacific culture, which is no longer on the exam. So I think that's something they recorded before they made any major test changes. So you can look at them if you're interested, but you just keep in mind that's not something you're going to have to study. I have been told that they are going to update them with material um, that will be covered on your exam. So let's go ahead and get started on looking at um, modern painting and how it challenged tradition. And so we're going to start first with just kind of a few um, ideas about the kinds of painting that as well as sculpture that was pretty typical before World War II. So we have expressionism. We've already talked about expressionism. Expressionism is based on emotion and um, you can see all of it listed here, but we've already talked about people like Van Gogh or Gauguin um, who looked at things like non-Western art and were trying to explain um, emotion, either their own or put in emotion um, of the people that they're depicting. Another style that's very common before World War II is abstraction. And so abstraction is a distortion of reality. When you look at this paper collage by Matisse, um, you know it's a person, but it doesn't look like a realistic dep depiction of a person. Um, it has a head, it has two arms, it has two legs, it has a torso, um, but it's not super realistic. And their influences were people like Cezanne, as well as looking at non-Western art, like things like um, coming out of the uh, colonies in Africa. We also have fantasy, and so a lot of people are going to be interested in this. This is the idea of exploring the human psyche. A lot of this is influenced by the new advancements in psychology, so people like Freud. And then lastly, realism never disappears. So realism um, was influenced by our realists like Courbet and Damier, and so a lot of realism is used for political work as well as things um, that were made for the people because the common everyday people understand realism before they understand fantasy or abstraction or expressionism. So style also changes a lot. And so we have our realism, we have our abstraction, and then we're going to have non-representational art um, by the time we get to 1950. And so we already have defined realism and abstraction, but let's look at non-representational. A lot of times this is also called abstract, so it gets really confusing. But non-representational or non-objective is based on uh, the elements of art. So things like line, shape, color. This Kandinsky at the very bottom is a really great example of this. When you look at it, it's a bunch of lines, it's a bunch of geometric shapes, and it's not really based on any sort of recognizable imagery. And so that will make its way into the art world as well. So the theme for modernism is art of the modern age. And this basically will take us all the way to the end of what will be tested on the AP exam. So we're going to go to about 1960. And so art tends to be less concerned about exterior visual reality and more about interior vision. So it's more about your inner emotions. Picasso said, an artist paints not what you see, but what you know is there. So it's really about art for art's sake and the idea that the artist gets to determine what the art is. The artist is no longer at the whim of the patron. This is probably not exactly true, but it should be known that artists are making art for themselves based on their own ideas rather than on the art ideas of their patron. There's a freedom of ex expression, um, their private concerns, their experience, their imagination is coming through of the artist. 
Um, they're often concerned with breaking compositional and subject matter rules, just like Manet uh, was breaking the rules. We see a lot of rule breakers in modern art. We're going to have two different kind of fractions, and it's really based on time. So the first half of the century is dominated by Paris. So the styles of Fauvism, Cubism, Surrealism. And then the second half of the century after World War II is really dominated by New York. So you'll see the art world will move to New York City and we'll have abstract expressionism and pop art being um, major art periods or art movements. So let's go ahead and get started with our Fauvist. Um, once I would like you to look at and compare how Fauvism is a departure from Impressionism. So what's the major differences between the artwork on the left and the artwork on the right? One of the things you might notice is how much more expressive the mark making is. This is by um, Henri Matisse and Matisse would actually leave the raw canvas showing in between a lot of his brushes or his brush strokes. So all that white that you see is not white paint. Sometimes it's not even primer. Sometimes it's just literally the canvas showing through. Um, another thing you might notice is there's not a lot of color mixing. If you look here at the bottom, you'll notice in this Monet that these colors had to be made. A lot of these colors here are probably straight out of the tube or maybe just a little bit tinted, so add a little bit of white to it. Um, but there's a lot more rich, sort of vivid color. So Fauvism is a French art movement and it was influenced by non-Western art. So the art of Africa, Polynesia, Central and South America, etc., as well as people like Van Gogh and Gauguin. Um, they're Rebellion against depictions of natural space. There's a lot of flat sort of linear patterns to their artwork. The color tends to be right out of the tube. It's very bright and vivid. The colors are often clashing. So they'll put colors next to each other that are kind of shocking. They'll use thick expressive brush stroke, emotional, Kind of quality to their mark making and to their color choices and often the subject matter is joyous doesn't mean it always is but often it is so a good example of this is this andre duran so i think it's i said it was matisse but this is andre duran um, so when you look at it um, how is it joyous what is joyous about it You might notice the color, the mark making, the rolling hills in the background, right? Here's some other examples of Durian's work. He uses a lot of directional brushwork. You notice the water flow, how it changes direction as it hits the bridge. You notice how the water flows horizontally, how the sky radiates from the sun or from the moon that's depicted in this image of London. Right. Um, Henri Matisse is probably the best known Fauvist, and this is a portrait that he made of his wife. And he said, color was not given to use in order that we should imitate nature, but so that we can express our emotions. And so he actually was a little bit afraid to um, show this artwork in an art show because he didn't think it depicted his wife in a very favorable line. But this is his image of a woman with a green stripe of his wife. And it looks sort of like her, right? But it's not realistic color. So here's some portraits by um, of Duran by Matisse and Matisse by Duran. Here's a good example of the joyous scenes of Henry Matisse or Henri Matisse. This is called The Joy of Life. And so it has that typical nude bodies in nature. Um, it has a scene of dancers in the background, very bright, sort of joyous color, very linear, very abstract. Um, one of my favorite things about Matisse is that he plays with space. Notice how he's breaking rules. How does he distort reality here? What is wrong 
or write about his depiction of space. One thing you might notice is that it's hard to delineate the difference between the table and the wall. And so he tends to flatten out his space. And so he has a tablecloth and it seems to be the same pattern as the wallpaper. And it doesn't go back into space the same way. He just uses a little line to separate it. And there's not a lot of space going back into the distance. There's no color or atmospheric perspective in the window that lets us know that things are going back into space. Probably the only thing that he did pretty realistically is this chair on the very left side. Um, if you get a chance, I love this video about his artist studio um, and the way that he did this painting. Um, it's amazing to think about, but what he did is he painted the whole canvas in this kind of light sort of yellowish color that you see on the contour lines, and then he painted everything but. So all the paintings on the wall, all the still life materials, all of this that is red, he painted on top of it. So he had to leave that skinny yellow line. So remember that painting at this time is about the act of painting. And so this is pretty radical, right? This is a new way of applying paint. So the next image we have is in the 250. And this one is one of those pieces that makes me scratch my head um, and understand why they put this one in and maybe not some of his better works. Um, but this one is called Goldfish for you. And so the discussion question is, tomorrow are going to be based on this artwork. And so um, it's going to be these four questions. How is it Favist? How does Matisse manipulate space? What's the focal point and why? And what could the fish symbolize? So I will have these as your discussion questions. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but you might go back and look at and think about what we talked about here and here and how he's manipulating space. And so um, feel free to look at the videos on Canvas um, or on Smart History in order to figure out your essay questions or your discussion questions, right? Um, it's good to note that this painting was done after Picasso painted the Ladies of Avignon. And so Matisse and Picasso were probably the most famous painters in the early 19th century or 20th century. And so they knew each other. They were both working out of Paris. They were in a way rivals. And so there's a lot of connection between um, the two of them and how they were both trying to kind of manipulate space and reality. But here's some other examples of, of um, fish that Matisse did as well. Late in his career, he was pretty much bedridden and it was very difficult for him to paint. And so he did a lot of collage. So collage is where you cut paper and you glue them. And so he would make these collages um, that are pretty famous as well. Right. So after the falls, we have Die Brücke or the bridge, which is a German group. And they were around until about World War I. They were an avant-garde group, so a, a group of artists who were um, contemporary, cutting edge, who were trying to make a bridge between the past and the future. So for them, the past was artists like Durer or Grunewald or Kranich. And they were um, looking at Nietzsche's theories, the journey of self-discovery. Um, they admired the Favist. Um, their work is a little bit more uh, complex. I wouldn't say it's not always as joyous, um, more concerned with emotional and spiritual qualities. Um, they often exaggerated and distorted forms, exaggerated colors, and they often focused on the ills of society, kind of to warn us of what's to come. And so if you think about World War I um, and what happened during all that devastation of World War I and then later World War II, they could see some of the evilness that was kind of creeping up in their culture. So this scene, um, how is it based on modern life? So think about how it is, it is based on modern life.
Okay, so this Kirchner is an image of people on a bridge, and most of his images were based on city streets. And so he has this bridge where men would frequent to pick up prostitutes. So even though it doesn't necessarily look like they're prostitutes, um, like Olympia by Manet, these are probably high-end prostitutes who were on these bridges waiting to escort these men. And so um, it looks very crowded, it's very claustrophobic, but you'll notice that they are kind of dressed um, like contemporary people. Here's his Dresden scene. Look at how odd his color usage is. Um, people seem kind of green. Look at this poor little child. Kind of feels like a monkey in a way, doesn't she? Kind of scary. The saturated pinks, very like distorted, sort of sick. Looking at who his subject matter is, um, how did he really feel about the people he was painting? These are you know, pretty much upper class people, um, the well-to-do, the people who are doing well. And he saw them as kind of sinister and corrupt. Look how angular they are. Think about the color uses that he uses, right? And so that leads us to his self-portrait as a soldier. So this is um, Kirchner. Let's go ahead and take a few moments just to look at this really closely. So let's do a close reading of this. What do you see in the foreground and what do you see in the background? Well, in the foreground, you might notice that Kirchner has portrayed himself as a soldier. But if you pay really close attention to it, you'll notice that he is missing his hand. Notice the one on the left side, so his right hand, he's missing his hand. Um, kind of odd. And then if you look behind him, we have this nude figure. And this isn't just any old nude figure. This is probably on a canvas if you pay really close attention. So more than likely, we're in the artist's studio. So looking at how he portrays himself, um, do you think this is a realistic depiction? No, it's very angular. It's very, um, he's got very large eyes. It's kind of um, geometric in a way. He shows himself as an, a soldier. And so he tried to join the German army, but was not fit for service. So he was allowed to be a driver instead of an actual soldier. He, um, suffered from some mental illness. Eventually, um, he, I believe, committed suicide um, during this time. And he believed that he was, you know, the whole idea of having a severed arm is that he was kind of unable to make art or to make good art during this time, and that he felt that war ruined the creative spirit. So look at how the De Baruch was inspired by the Favis. What are some of the similarities that we saw with Favism? How is this expressive? So it has very vivid, rich color. You see some big, broad brush stroke in other places, especially when you look at his uniform. There's also an angularness and exaggeration to it. He so admired what they called primitive arts, which was more like the art that was coming from the colonies. So there was a lot of museums that Kirchner and then other people like Picasso would go to these ethnographic museums, kind of like our um, field museum today in Chicago, and they'd look at African masks. And so you can see that exaggerated brow, those large geometric eyes, that long protruding nose and lips and you can see how he might be have been influenced by some African masks. Um, Kirchner's work was shown in the Degenerate Art Show. We don't really have time to watch this show, but during World War II, um, the Nazi propaganda um, machine 
put on a an art show of what was considered to be good art versus bad art. And so a lot of artists um, working in the styles that we're going to be talking about um, for the next few weeks were really um, not considered or admired by the Germans. And so they were, the show was kind of moved from city to city so that people would see um, what would like, um, what was deemed unfit um, in the art world. And a lot of these artists um, lost their careers. I believe Kirchner's um, work was in here and he was pretty devastated. Um, we do have some other artists who were not really part of any particular group. And so um, Kari Kolowitz was another German artist who um, worked in an expressive style. And so here's some examples of her portrait work. So this is her self-portrait. Think about how she's expressive. She uses very intense mark making, very intense expressions. Look at that gaze of her eyes, the mark making. She made a lot of political art. And so what do you think her political leanings were? She made art of the people. Um, she was not a Nazi. Um, she was not a communist. But she did believe in um, rights of the less privileged, um, people who were hurting, so maybe um, the poor, people with young children. You can see how society is kind of blind. They're wearing blindfolds behind. Here's a mother with a casket or a coffin of a young child. Very stark, very sad, very somber artworks by Kolowitz. Now, can you tell what media she's typically using in? It is a reference to her Germanic heritage. Yes, she does a lot of woodcuts. And so um, her artworks um, were sometimes drawn or in lithograph, but she also did a lot of woodcuts. Um, and that leads us to looking at our piece in the 250. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to it. And that is our memorial sheet to Karl Liebknick. I hope I said his name right. Liebknick. There we go. Right. So what's the focal point of this print? And how does she move our eye there? So where does your eye tend to go? When I look at this composition, I actually start with the faces at the very top. And so I look from character to character and I start from the right and I kind of move to the left. And then you'll notice that there's a series of people kind of bending over and it pulls my eye down, down, down to Carl, right? So the man that has died at the very bottom. You might notice the contrast between the darkness of them and the lightness of him. He even has kind of like this halo sort of glow around him, right? And there's a lot of vertical lines around that halo that really directs your eye down. Even the mark making on these figures are pointing you towards him. So for me, I think that he is the focal point. Right, and you'll notice how she separates the composition. She creates these horizontal sections that kind of divides it into three. So, motivation what do you think her motivation for making the artwork is, and why is she choosing to use woodcuts? She was an anti war activist and artist, and she would make prints to sell to the middle class. She dedicated this to Liebknecht, a communist leader that she admired, even though she wasn't a communist. She was definitely a leftist. And she showed him kind of like a Christ-like figure. So you could maybe compare this to like Lamentation by Giotto. And she chose to use woodcut because it was a very traditional German media. So she's kind of reaching back into the past. She viewed it as more of a primitive art style, something that was very raw. And of course, because like many of the prints that we've talked about so far, you can make multiples of it and that you could circulate a lot of copies of it to the populace. So it was cheaper art form as well as it could 
get out her message. Um, if you have time, I would suggest watching A Case for Abstraction by um, the art assignment. And so if you're so interested, this would be a good video as well. Do you want to learn to draw professional and impressive artwork from scratch that will blow people's minds? I'm Scott. I won't watch the For whole thing For much of human you, history, when people I'll set out to make started. art, they did so by trying to represent things as they appeared in the world around them. And then, about a hundred years ago, a bunch of artists stopped trying to do that. It was shocking. This is not what art was supposed to be or do. And no one was given a compass, really, for navigating this new art terrain, for interpreting it, for appreciating it. It's less shocking now, but it still upsets and confounds. How are we supposed to deal with an art completely untethered from the world of recognizable objects? And more importantly, why should we? This is the case for abstraction. It's important to note that we didn't just dive headlong into complete abstraction in art. J.M.W. Turner's seascapes, for example, demonstrate that things that exist in the world can often look abstract. James McNeil Whistler's nocturnes show this too, as do Victor Hugo's ink drawings. But as the 19th century unfolded, with the Industrial Revolution and the invention of I'm photography, gonna stop, life in European and American cities changed dramatically, and it should come as no...